Uh, not just yet, though. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, you can play whatever you want. Okay, cool beans. Uh, I'm here to uh, give the uh, Jewish side of uh, the issue of religion and homosexuality. Uh, just to be clear, I'm no expert, I'm not a rabbi, I'm just the only Orthodox Jew within God only knows how many hundreds of miles. Uh, so, yeah, we're in Texas. <laughs> no, this, this part of Texas, Dallas and Houston, lots of Orthodox Jews, they just stay there. Uh, they don't venture this far into the desert. Anyway, we've done that before. It didn't work out well. Anyway. But <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, that's the level of joke that's going to go on, so you need to get used to that. Uh, at any rate, uh, so just to be clear, I'm not a rabbi. Uh, I am a layman. I put together some things uh, to give you a little information to mostly to dispel some of the things that are said by uh, the very hateful groups like Westboro Baptist Church and whatnot who tend to rely on the Old Testament uh, when talking about the negatives of the, the uh, LGBTQ community because uh, what you call the Old Testament tends to be a little more fire and brimstone than the New Testament, so uh, it works into their particular version of uh, false representations, false translations, and, and hatred. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how some of the things that they say are not accurate. Uh, I'm going to begin with a uh, video on YouTube. Uh, this is uh, uh, the wonder, the wondering Jew, uh, spelled like wondering, like oh, the wonder of the universe. Uh, and uh, he's just going to kind of lead things off for me, and then I'm going to uh, continue on with the serious academic stuff. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to share my point of view of the world as I view it through the lens of the Torah. The purpose of this particular video vlog is to elucidate my interpretation of how the Torah views homosexuality, and the secondary purpose is to share my own personal political view of what the role of government should be in regards to homosexual marriage. Again, I'm only speaking for myself, I'm not speaking for any group or religious organization. This is my own personal opinion, and I'm sharing it with you because you have nothing else better to do. Or do you? So first, let's start off with a definition of what exactly is the Torah's prohibition against homosexuality. Now, first we have to understand that there are two general classifications of mitzvahs, or commandments. The first are the ones that are between man and his fellow, or mitzvahs being adam lechavero. Those are mitzvahs like don't steal, don't kill, so on and so forth. Then there are mitzvahs that are particularly between man and God, or mitzvahs being Adam Lemakum. Now, the prohibition against homosexual behavior falls under the category of mitzvahs being Adam Lemakum, mitzvahs that apply between man and God. And the Torah calls this prohibition a to'eva, or an abomination. But what a lot of people forget is that the Torah calls a lot of other things abominations as well, and yet they don't receive the same amount of attention in the news. <coughs> For example, did you know that eating non-kosher food is considered a to'eva in the eyes of God? So what makes me wonder is, why do we see protests that say this? God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. But we don't see protests that say this. I'm not bacon. God hates bacon. In the eyes of the Torah, we are taught to True story. hate the sin but love the sinner. Like it says in Yechezkel, there is no mitzvah to show prejudice and hate towards people that choose to live an alternative lifestyle. Just because a person doesn't practice my religion and have the same beliefs that I do, doesn't give me license to treat them any differently. This is a mitzvah being Adam Lamakum, a mitzvah between man and God, and it's really none of my business. If I want people to respect my religious space and practices, I have to show that same respect. So in general, I bet you're asking, as a Torah Jew, do I agree with the homosexual lifestyle? Absolutely not. It goes against the very inherent nature of what the Torah wants. But you know what? That's my own personal and religious convictions. And it's not my place to impose my beliefs on others or treat them any differently. The same way I wouldn't want to be treated differently based on my religious beliefs. So do I believe that homosexual marriage should be banned by the government? Well, let me answer your question with a question. Classic Jewish strategy. Sorry. Do I want the federal government to overturn the exemptions that they made in the Humane Slaughter Act? 
that allow Jewish people to conduct ritual slaughter? And also, do I want the federal government to listen to all of those groups that want to ban Jewish circumcision? The National Organization of Circumcision Information Resource Centers in California spends tens of thousands of dollars in trying to raise awareness over the evils of ritual circumcision and are trying to lobby both state and federal governments to overturn this ancient Jewish practice. So, no, I, I don't want the government interfering with my own personal religious beliefs. So it can't be a one-way street. If I feel that way about myself, why can't I feel that way about another group who I may not necessarily agree with, but respect their personal choices? When we as a society begin restricting the individual freedoms of a small group of people, a group of people whose beliefs we may not necessarily agree with, it's only a matter of time before we end up suffering a similar fate. We as the Jewish people should know what it feels like to have individual freedoms taken away from us from governments that don't necessarily agree with our lifestyle choices. Okay. So, Dr. Chalaminsky there is part of a very orthodox, very observant part of Judaism. And he, when he was saying there about Judaism not accepting homosexuality, he does not accept homosexuality. Like he said, that's his view and his interpretation of the Torah. Uh, my wife, Chelsea, is going to come up after I get done speaking and talk a little bit about how there is a new movement within Judaism that tries to be more inclusive of the alternative sexualities uh, and, you know, to show a different side of Orthodox Judaism. Uh, now, again, I'm just here to sort of talk about Orthodox Judaism, uh, conservative, reform, reconstructionist, all the other versions of Judaism uh, I can't really speak to. So, uh, one of the things that Dr. Chalaminsky touched on, which is discussed quite often by the very uh, hate-filled groups, is the fact that homosexuality is an abomination, according to the Old Testament. Uh, and that only is homosexuality referred to as an abomination, and that is roundly false. Uh, there are over 50 occasions within the Levitican laws and all the laws that make up the 613 commandments uh, that uh, Jews have to obey. Uh, amongst them, mostly, we're going to be talking about uh, sexual uh, issues, like homosexuality is listed in the Torah, but we'll get to that later. Uh, um, not keeping kosher is one of the biggest issues of uh, toeva, uh, such as eating uh, fish that does not have uh, scales and fins, uh, eating land animals that don't have four legs, a cloven hoof, and chews its own cud, uh, birds of prey, and almost all animals. Uh, any sort of animal that would fall into that uh, realm is considered to be forbidden for us to eat, uh, and as such would be an abomination if we were to consume them. So if we're going, you know, these groups, they talk about how hateful against God, you know, the, like Dr. Chalaminsky was talking about, uh, that it was uh, just, uh, uh, oh, the Hebrew word just slipped my mind, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, that it's a, a sin against God to be a homosexual. Well, is it really so bad if listing all of these foods are, that, you, that we can't eat is also considered to be an abomination? Uh, so they skew the interpretation of the Torah there to put far more emphasis on the law against homosexuality uh, than perhaps a lot of Torah scholars would. Um, okay, so one of the things that they talk about is that the Torah is very clear on homosexuality being an abomination and that anyone who commits the sin of uh, homosexuality needs to be stoned. Well, they're taking a very narrow view of uh, the punishment for committing a homosexual act. Uh, so I wanted to talk about real quick the requirements that would have to take place in order to carry out a capital sentence against anyone uh, breaking any sort of a commandment in uh, Judaism. And this is not just sexual issues, but breaking kosher or working on a Saturday. Uh, it would be a number of things. So firstly, Two witnesses have to witness the actual sin taking place. Uh, and they have to be adult Jewish men who keep all of the commandments, know the written and oral law, and have legitimate professions. They have to each witness the sin at the exact same time. Uh, they have to be able to speak clearly without any speech impediment or hearing deficit 
to ensure that when they give a warning to the person committing that sin, that not only can they hear the warning, but that when it is responded, the person giving the warning can hear it as well. Uh, so those are just the qualifications to be a witness. Uh, beyond that, the two witnesses have to see each other so that there is a confirmation that the person committing the sin received two warnings separately. Uh, da, 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 uh, uh, both have to give a warning, that, uh, and not only warning them, but warning the person committing the sin that the sin is a capital offense. Uh, it goes on, uh, that the warning has to be delivered within seconds of the performance of the sin. Uh, that it has to be in the time to say, peace unto you, my rabbi and my master. So literally, like, you know, you can't be, oh, I saw the guy committing the sin, and then I had a sandwich, uh, and then I saw what was on TV. Oh, hey, and that's a capital offense. You shouldn't do that. No, 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 no. It has to be instantly by both people witnessing the event. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, in the same time, uh, the person about to sin had to respond that he or she was familiar with the punishment, but they were going to commit the sin anyway, and then they actually had to then commit the sin. Uh, the Bet Din, the rabbinical court who would hear this case, uh, had to uh, examine each witness separately, and if even one point of the evidence that they delivered was contradictory, even a very minor point, such as the eye color of the person committing the sin, then they would throw the case out because there's a discrepancy within the story. Uh, the Bet Din was comprised of 23 judges. So not just one single judge deciding on this case, there were 23 people on the Bet Din deciding this issue. Uh, the majority could not even be a simple majority. Uh, the split verdict would have to allow the conviction, uh, to allow the conviction would have to be at least 13 at, uh, uh, in favor, uh, with 11, of course, uh, finding the person guilty. Uh, if the bet then arrived at a unanimous verdict, meaning that every single judge thought that the person committing the sin was guilty, the person would be let go. The idea being that if someone were, you know, that if not even one judge on the panel could find some shred of exculpatory evidence, uh, then something had to be wrong with the court itself. Now, with all of the, oh, and then, oh, sorry, the big one there at the end, I almost left the most important one out, uh, the witnesses themselves had to be willing to be executioners. Wow. Right. So you have to think about, you know, yes, there are uh, abominations in the Torah where the punishment could lead to a death sentence. But with all of those qualifiers involved there, do you really think that it was set up in a way to just kill anybody who committed any little sin? No. It was purposefully established to try to make it exquisitely difficult to uh, carry out a capital sentence so that anyone could have the possibility to acknowledge that they committed the sin and repent. Uh, now, of course, modern interpretations, we're not asking people to repent from homosexuality, but working on a Sabbath, hey, maybe, you know, don't watch football that day. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's asking a lot in Texas. I, I'm well aware. Okay. Uh, now, it was not just uh, stum or, uh, acts of homosexuality uh, that would lead to someone possibly getting stoned. Uh, it was intercourse between a man and his mother, intercourse between a man and his father's wife, uh, not specifically a mother, but, you know, stepmother or something of that nature. Uh, intercourse between a man and his daughter-in-law, intercourse between the man's wife in the first stages of marriage, intercourse between two men, bestiality, cursing in the name of God, idol worship, uh, sorcery, uh, trying to convince people to worship idols, witchcraft, violating the Sabbath, uh, a number of different things. So again, the Westboro Baptist Church, they tend to focus just on the issue uh, of homosexuality, but there were a number of different things that could qualify one for possibly receiving a capital sentence, and then as we went over just, uh, earlier, it's exquisitely difficult to carry out a capital sentence. So what does this mean under Jewish law for the everyday person walking around who is not a Jew? that you have to follow the no-eyed laws. Uh, what are the no-eyed laws? It, it's uh, the laws that Judaism feels that non-Jews should have to abide by. Uh, it's an oral law that was given after Noah, uh, or to Noah after the flood happened, uh, and it, it's basically very simple. It's far less complicated than what Jews have to follow with the 613 mitzvot. Uh, murder is forbidden. Theft is forbidden. Uh, sexual immorality is forbidden. Eating the flesh of a still-living animal is forbidden. 
So I think most people are okay with that one. Uh, belief in or worship of idols, uh, blaspheming against God, and that society must establish a legal system that is just and proper. So even in these laws that are given to Gentiles, uh, there is still the commandment to set up a legal system that is just and fair. So even though, once again, we do see the issue of sexual immorality coming into play, we still see the emphasis of judging people fairly on that issue, and again, applying the laws that we talked about before, extremely difficult uh, for someone to be uh, put to death over sexual immorality issues. Uh, so, that's trying to dispel all the nuttiness of the Westboro Baptist Church, of which there is much. Uh, so, my wife Chelsea, if you would come up here, hon, uh, is going to talk about how uh, there are a number of people within Orthodox Judaism today who do not take to these extreme views, who are very accepting of the LGBTQ community. Beautiful. <laughs> Score some points there. Um, okay, so far I'm confusing myself, but I don't have all the information in front of me. Um, so there is actually a very successful nonprofit organization. I'm going to put their information. Um, that is for full inclusion and equality of um, the LGBTQ community within Judaism. So what that would mean is that um, if you do have a gay child, that child would be considered just as much Jewish as their straight father, basically. Because that's what the issue comes down to, is can you be Jewish and gay? Um, it's not so much that you're a bad person for being gay, it's that they have a different relationship with God, and that's what the focus is on. So there is an organization, I'll take it over here. It's a really great um, organization if you have the time to look at it. It's called Kashet. Um, and that's their website there. And so they're just their really big push is for <laughs> inclusion. Um, if you know much about Judaism or if you don't, we are very, very, very centered on our families and loving our children. It's the most important thing. So this organization was brought in part by um, families of people who had Jewish um, <coughs> children who were gay, and they felt that their love of their children was the most important thing, and they wanted them included in their society, and basically to give them a raise. So in their everyday life, they dictate when we sleep, what we eat, they take off, everything, especially when you're in Orthodox Judaism, and they want their children to be part of that no matter if they're um, LGBTQ or not. So I would recommend looking them up. They are a really great organization. <laughs> but they do a lot of great stuff. Um, they start off in Boston, but now they are all throughout the United States and in Israel. So you have a chance. Uh, are we doing questions?